I'm so happy um, to be presenting to Passive House Accelerator. It is truly an honor to be here with Oka and, um, and with my team. So um, first of all, can you hear me okay? How's the sound? Doing all right? All right, great, great, great. Uh, before we get started, like I said, if you have a question, toss it in the chat. We're going to try to get to all of them before we're done. I want to start off with, uh, with who we are. So uh, we are Bright Common, an award-winning architecture practice in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, founded in 2011. And we have a simple slogan, high concept, low carbon, all people. We design buildings in this age of adaptation that we're all finding ourselves in. And that includes for us, deep energy retrofits, market rate and affordable passive housing, and mixed use multifamily projects ranging from two to so far 120 units and, uh, and beyond. And tonight we'll be showcasing a project we designed for Argo Property Group in our hometown of Philadelphia. The focus will be on more on what it's like to uh, develop and certify a project like this through a pandemic. I, I, I just wanna say, give a caveat, it's probably more at a high level to talk about this process. There'll be some focus, some detail, but it's, there's not gonna be like a lot of these deep dive hyper-focused zooms like you might normally see in construction tech. So I think we're gonna be back for hopefully a part two for, for that stuff. So lastly, um, you know, all of our work is a team effort. And I just wanna say one of the greatest pleasures of my career has been to know, uh, get to know and, and, and learn from this wonderful person, Ilke Cassidy of Holstrom System. Ilke and I have worked on many passive house projects together. Uh, including the design of their second Holstrom, Holstrom system house, which um, just received source zero certification. So I'm just really happy to be doing work with her. And um, okay, you want to just take a minute to introduce yourself? I think everybody knows you, but go for it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely some introduction here. Thank you. And uh, I can just, you know, give it back to you. It was definitely uh, awesome to work with you on, um, you know, the single family home, but also zero six. It's definitely been um, quite a journey <laughs> since the beginning. So I oh, actually yeah. had to go back very far into my archives in the in my uh, FIAS folder to um, you know dig out all my my Wolfie files and everything from the start to now. So it's definitely uh, it's it's been a journey. So uh, yeah, just to introduce myself, I'm. Um, co-founder of um, Holzram Systems. And typically when we present or we talk about, we actually talk about our process of translating um, design intent into some you know, prefabrication um, parts-based modeling and uh, you know, turning it into prefabricated panels. Um, while we do that, we always look at uh, thermal bridge free detailing and air sealing. And, um, you know, we also do passive house consulting and energy modeling. I definitely like uh, energy modeling quite a bit. And, it's so uh, good. So good. <laughs> yeah. So I was fortunate enough to work with, uh, with Jeremy on this project. And I just wanted to, uh, you know, shout out to Steve. Steve Hessler, my heart's own partner. He's right there. Hessler. Thanks for showing up. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'm excited to show you this project. Thanks, Ilka. Let's, let's get into it. So I wanted to start off with a little background um, to talk about we're in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the United States. And um, this is a slide from Philadelphia's Climate Action Playbook. And it just talks about what shapes Philadelphia's carbon footprint. And I think it surprises a lot of our clients. Um, this is Philadelphia's Climate Action Playbook, which is a really wonderful document. We show all of our clients and they're all always really shocked to learn that buildings and industry are 75% of our local carbon footprint. They all think it's gonna be cars and it's, uh, you know, it's transportation and waste are about 25%. So that matters, but you know, the carbon footprint of your location matters. Uh, for us in, in a dense urban city, uh, the, the buildings really matter. Um, and so all of our work as architects must respond in a meaningful way. Uh, zooming in a little bit, um, as you can see on the left is Philadelphia. Uh, my hometown, and it is a uh, it is a city of homes, uh, which includes plus or minus 400,000 attached row houses and tens of thousands of empty lots. These conditions uh, have been the proving these conditions have been a proving ground for a decade long design lab uh, decade long design laboratory for us to experiment with urban infill passive house at multiple scales and markets. 
pushing us to develop increasingly flexible and iterative strategies that can be applied to almost any site. Like if you, if you can learn how to do this stuff in a mixed human climate zone and a post-industrial city, you can kind of do it anywhere. So we, we, it's never boring. And I could say that after 10 years doing this, it is never boring. I wish it was some days. So from retrofits to fire ratings, encroachments, easements, zoning overlays, underpinning, an increasingly bureaucratic city government and all manner of unforeseen and unsavory existing conditions, it has and continues to be an evolving and invigorating landscape within which to design the future of housing. And all of that was before the pandemic. So we're also fortunate, I, I, we also design within a community and I can tell you that it's amazing to be part of a talented and supportive community of fellow Passive House designers like Ilka and many others, consultants, engineers, and, and also in this culture of people who are striving in this very DIY way to make the world a better place. Um, I, I wake up every day and, and, and I just feel like it's an amazing time to, a time and a place to live, to live and work in and to practice in. Our specific site, if you look at this map down on the right, is in a neighborhood called Allegheny West, or uh, it's also called Paradise. Um, it is the small yellow triangle. That's a, it's only a few blocks wide and it's bounded on three sides, this sort of green shape. It's bounded on three sides by three historic cemeteries. So the neighbors call it Paradise because it's kind of like being in the afterlife. <laughs> um, read into that as you will. Uh, in urban infill construction, we don't, we don't get to pick orientation or adjacent conditions, but we lucked out here as the long axis, you can see on this, this, this top right image, these are the six townhomes here, right? That face is south, that never happens. And also there's no buildings to underpin on this site, which also never happens. But our luck ran out a little bit during design as we found out very quickly that the street, uh, Lippincott Street that they face on did not have a sewer. So the developers had to foot the bill for a private sewer. So that will uh, kill your insulation budget right there. Um, all right, I'm gonna try something. Shannon, did you get my message about the countdown timer? No, I did not, Kim. Okay, cool, that worked out. Um, uh, <laughs> do you have a countdown timer on your iPhone or something like where you could, you could, you could, or just a countdown timer or whatever? Countdown right. timer, I'll find one. So one of the things when we did in the pre-call was I realized I kept using the term row houses. And if you're not from Philly, you may not want to, you don't know what a row house is. You may not know what a hoagie is. We're not gonna talk about hoagies right now. So. I kind of, I want to be a little bit more inclusive. And so I went to the trouble of preparing this presentation with, in the presentation. And so Shannon, if you could keep time for me, I'm going to attempt something I've never done before. And that is to share a brief history of the Philadelphia Row House Pecha Kucha style to do 10 slides, 20 seconds each, totaling three minutes and 20 seconds. And so um, put your seatbelt on. This is going to get a little bumpy. Let me know when you're ready, Shannon. We got to synchronize our, our thing. So I am synchronizing my clock. Uh, the I, I actually have a countdown timer to my interval timer. We're going to do this right. Five, four, three, two, one. Oops. All right. Quaker and pacifist William Penn's green country town was a revolutionary but naive idea in 1682 when he founded Philadelphia. His first land purchases quickly subdivided the sprawling lots, immediately abandoning his ideals. He did get his wide streets on a rectangular gridded plan though. Industrial capitalism demanded dense workers housing along the prosperous waterfront, proving once again that with few exceptions, the built environment is nearly always the love child of economic and political forces made with the cheapest available materials decorated in the style of its time. 118 years later in 1803, Thomas Carstairs, a feisty, no-nonsense Scottish immigrant carpenter designed and built 22 brick row houses for William Sansom, creating the first speculative housing development in the United States, what is now the South Side of Jewelers Row. Why is Philadelphia a red brick city, do you ask? And I heard you ask. Well, English settlers who survived the devastating Great Fire of London in 1666 embraced Georgian construction with shared fire resistant party walls. Plus Philadelphia sat on a high quality brick clay bed, so extensive, that after two centuries of mining has still produced more than 200 million bricks by the year 1900, adjacently spurring the patented invention of multiple brick making machines. What is a row house you are still asking from the Philadelphia Row House Manual? The Philadelphia Row House, most simply, is a one to four story, a one to four story house occupying a narrow street frontage and attached to adjacent houses on both sides. 
What are some row house types you ask? And I did hear you. There were many variations of row houses to house the rich and poor cheek by jowl at 300 square feet. The band box or Trinity was America's original tiny house with 10 foot by 10 foot floor plates. Carstairs Row is a London house plan doubling the, uh, the tiny Trinity. Wealthy Philadelphians dwelled in Georgian townhouses like this one on the bottom. By the end of the 19th century, Philadelphia had become the workshop of the world with 50 square miles of row houses and factories, in large part owing to the expansion of the humble row house, later described as a successful mix of immigration, employment, coal, real estate, and banking, it had become the quintessential object of industrial Philadelphia. In 1893, 25 million people visited the Columbian Exposition in Chicago, which included Philadelphia's full-scale display of a two-story working men's house. This exemplar for egalitarian housing stoked the desire for the American dream so much so that visitors to the exhibit wore out the floorboards, or so the legend says. With their built-in adiabatic walls, row homes make excellent candidates for passive house retrofits. Here's a diagram of a foam-free, all electric one we designed that made our clients very happy. For all the info you can handle and then some on the subject, download the free collectively authored passive row house manual from Green Building United. North Americans today predominantly live in detached single family homes with two prominent exceptions. The majority of New Yorkers live in multifamily buildings with 20 more units. And in Philadelphia, about 60% of us live in a single detached residence or what we call row homes. Does this make Philadelphia uniquely un-American or radically progressive? You decide. How'd I do? Let's hope you got any of that in. So that's the row house. Now you know what it is. I'll do a Pecha Coochie on the hoagie at the end of the thing. So, and I promise Ilka's coming up any minute. All right, let's talk about what it takes the next, uh, I, I wanna talk about next about what it takes to, to make the next generation of row housing in what we're, we're calling this new age of adaptation. So what you're seeing here is a rendering of the project we're gonna present uh, called the Zero Six. Um, it is six detached townhomes, uh, which in, in some ways they're more multifamily than multiple single families. And that is gonna come up time and time again, but in a neighborhood filled with like smaller attached homes, we didn't want it to look like a big box. Philadelphians hate multifamily housing. We hate it, including the ones I designed. After subdividing the parcel, we were able to fit um, six four-story townhomes and they each have a footprint that's 20 foot, 10 inches wide, which is really wide for a row house and 31 foot, seven inches deep, which is actually really shallow. So they're really tall, small, wide houses, if that makes sense. Uh, the home's massing is meant to nod back to traditional Philadelphia row homes, like the way Carstairs Row has these mansard roofs and, 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 and gabled roofs with dormers at, at the fourth and fifth floor, things like that, but in a modern way. So it has this three-story, what we're calling a super mansard overhanging the carport, broken up with like one and two story dormers, just to throw things off a little bit. They're clad in slate shingles on the front and painted fiber cement uh, lap siding in the rear. Um, there was really limited space for solar PV on this project, but we were, thanks to Elka's help and solar states, we were able to attain FIAS plus 2018 source zero energy pre-certification with the canopies. And more on that in a minute. And finally, finally, what you've been waiting for, Elka Cassidy. Yeah, so um, I was I was very fortunate to be um, part of this team, which was very exciting um, to look at this uh, this row of townhomes. And um, as Jeremy talked about, there it's it's kind of interesting because it's like how do you look at a building like this? Is it a single family home? Is it a multifamily? Like how do you uh, wrap your, your head around it? And I think initially we all kind of sat down and we're like, of course it's a sing single family home, right? Because it's gonna be sold individually. It's gonna be metered individually. So uh, going through passive house certification, of course we would treat them as single family homes. And that's basically how we started out with this project. And what was really interesting was that we were uh, we signed up for this uh, with FIAS for this project and uh, there was a deadline to when we needed to sign up uh, before they switched completely over from 2000 from the 2015 
uh, certification uh, goals to the 2018 and we just uh, I cut somehow I, I knew about that deadline and I was like Jeremy let's just sign up before and so that we have both choices because I didn't really know I hadn't really um, modeled anything through the 2018 um, criteria so I wasn't sure what's going to be beneficial for us or not or what the changes were so we basically started out with modeling this uh, under the um, 2015 fee certification and treating everything as a single family home so and basically we have three different uh, units one on the west side and then there are four in the middle and then one on the east side and uh, when fee is switched to the 2015 target um, or certification what they did is uh, to make everything climate specific so your targets um, you know, that were automatically generated in FIAS were climate specific at that point, which that which differentiate, differentiated them from um, from PHI at that point. So as you can see, each one of those cases has the, uh, the same targets in terms of uh, heating, cooling demand and loads. And uh, there's also a certain uh, source energy goal, I think it was a little over 6000 kilowatt hours per person per year. So I modeled each one of those units and I actually originally signed them up each one like four, six different buildings with FIAS. And then uh, we realized it's, it's kind of impossible to get there. And these, these were already modeled with very hefty um, assembly. So it wasn't just, you know, going from code or starting out with code. This was, um, I think already like our, 40 walls or something. So something pretty uh, substantial. And we realized that there's no way that we can actually get there. And as you can see, what's interesting is that each one of those models pretty, pretty differently. So the one in the in the Spheres 2015 scenario, I think the middle one actually had the maybe the most chances of actually getting certified at the end. But again, we realized this is not gonna happen. So we switched over to the 2018. Um, Is there one you want me to move forward to? Okay. Yeah, the next one. Okay, there you go. So uh, this is now switching over to the 2018. And the big change there was that it wasn't just a climate specific, but also, um, a project specific. So there's a there's a calculator online that you can uh, that determines basically your target um, targets for heating, cooling demand, and and loads. So um, and you know I have to uh, kind of input certain criteria that makes its pro projects specific, and then each of those um, scenarios basically gets a different uh, tar different targets. And for the middle one, that actually didn't work out so well. So it's really interesting because overall, you can see that your, um, your energy dem demand is the lowest on the, on the middle one, but because of how the calculator works uh, with you know, looking at the, at the envelope um, surface, it actually has way stricter target goals than the other two scenarios. So, I think we determined, I, th I think only though the one on the West actually had chances to meet certification. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we were kind of scratching our heads pretty heavily and we we're like, okay, what are we gonna do? So then we actually thought, hmm, maybe we'll just look at it. We'll scrap the whole, you know, single family home, town home idea and just look at it in terms of uh, one big block as basically a multifamily, um, uh, project and that's what we did so next slide and again I ran it through the 2015 versus the 2018 um, certification goals and uh, it turned out that the 2018 were actually uh, working out better because our targets were um, you know, calculated differently, were project specific. So with, and through all of this, these are all the same assemblies. I didn't really change any assemblies, assemblies up to that date. So uh, this is really just kind of going through how everything behaves, behaves under basically the same, um, 
circum circumstances. So um, we saw that, yeah, 2018 is going to be the way to go. And with uh, if we if you go with uh, the FIAS Plus 2018, one of the things that changed was that the source energy goals were um, were getting stricter. So if we wanted to meet source uh, or FIAS Plus 2018, we realized that we had to uh, include some PV. Yep. And then at that point, we we're like, okay, once we include some PV, we might as well go all the way out. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's that's basically that was our our marching order. <laughs> we set our our parameters, and we knew what we're gonna how we we were gonna certify and how to go about it. Um, next. And slide. it's interesting to note that mm -hmm. just so everyone knows, another thing in Philadelphia that. Well, I always try to not design houses with these fussy roof decks. They, they, but apparently you cannot sell a new construction home in Philadelphia if you do not put a roof deck that gets used three days a year. That is just the truth. You will not win with any developer, even if they agree with you, they can't sell it. And these also have garages too. We'll get into that in a minute, but you'll, you'll see that they, they kind of stand on one leg because it's more of a carport than a garage, but that's becoming a thing too. So it, yeah. And leave that alone but it, it, it when you have to put solar on it means a canopy so there's a lot of extra costs yeah so next next slide sure please um so now knowing what we gonna, we were going to do um we went ahead and um you know jeremy and, and jordan from bright common really just kind of dove into all the details and assemblies you know, together with the energy modeling, they basically created uh, all the drawings for this. And uh, at this point, I would like to just kind of talk about a little bit what it actually means to go through certification, because a lot of times these days, people, you know, a lot of people say, oh yeah, we build passive houses and uh, meaning that, yeah, they're highly insulated and lowered or tested, but they might not necessarily go through actually the certification. And I just wanted to point out how, um, um, how much value there is in actually going through certification because there is a whole nother, you know, very, very knowledgeable uh, third party that's gonna look at all your, your drawings and uh, basically prevent you from making mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there, there are certain criteria for um, assemblies that uh, are set by, by FIAS. And if you don't meet those criteria, they ask you to do a hydrothermal analysis just to make sure that everything is going to perform and well and not start molding, you know, and making sure that your indoor air quality is, is okay. So I, I feel like that's, that's a huge service for um, the developer, for yep. the architect, everyone who's responsible for this, for me, you know, I mean, I, I can look at it and say, oh yeah, it looks good, but I think it's something totally different if, if there's like, you know, these people that are so experienced really just kind of make, making sure that everything is, is good. So uh, we did have to do a couple of hydrothermal analysis, one for the for the roof and it turned out to be okay, it turned out to be safe. And then for the one for the wall assembly and when, one big reason for that was because there is um, different conditions for the, the siding or the cladding. So on the bottom there is brick and brick really holds moisture pretty well. So it was kind of important to look at, you know, does, does this all, is this all able to, to dry out accordingly? So that was that was helpful. That's something that we we went through and got a green light. Um, next slide, please. And then the other thing is thermal bridge um, analysis. So again, we uh, or Bright Common drew up these these details and we we submitted them. And then Fias looked at it and it's like, mm, you know, we're a little concerned here, we're a little concerned there. We can see that there's a, a thermal bridge there. So um, one thing is to do the the therm analysis to get the value, um, you know, to put to put into the energy model because that's something that has to be accounted for for energy purposes. And uh, I think one of them, and the longer, of course, this condition is, the more impact it has on the energy model. And we did, you know, see some changes there. So the and that's the interesting part too. Like once you dive 
deeper and deeper into the project, there are all these things that come up and, you know, the, the needle kind of swings here and there. And sometimes it's a little bit nerve wracking, right? Because <laughs> you still want to stay under that target line. But um, again, it's, it's all valuable information because besides the just the, the heat loss or the, um, you know, the thermal bridge itself, what's really in, important or accounting for it, it's really important to also look at um, uh, um, condensation risk. So because that at the end, you know, turns into um, mold and, and bad air, indoor air quality. So it's really important that someone um, really looks at this and says, okay, this is, uh, it, this is a thermal bridge, you have to account for it, but it is safe. So you can build it that way. You're not gonna encounter any kind of moisture or condensation um, accumulating at that spot. So again, very, very valuable. So we went through all of this. We basically went through a few um, review rounds and we're almost there. And then the pandemic hit. <laughs> so, uh, and basically- I mean, did it though? Did, did it happen? I don't remember anything at this uh, point. Though, I remember getting that email. That was a tough day. <laughs> Tom Hanks got it and this project, uh, that was a tough day, but hey, mm -hmm. here we are, we're still in it. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I got that email from Jeremy saying, well, I guess we're stopping this. And I was like, Jeremy, we're almost there. Oh my gosh, we were like literally <laughs> at the finish line. Yeah, know? there were just a couple of things that we just had to submit and uh, we're like, let's just go for it. Yeah. There, there are things, you know, where we could optimize this definitely. Yep. Like I think we definitely, you know, going through these rounds and adjusting and everything, we did realize at the end, you know, and there's there's a little change in the fees calculator too. Yep. That at the end, we realized, yeah, this th these assemblies are definitely uh, robuster than we need them to be. Yeah, but we can't really, you know, have. We just had. The, I felt like we were just like get that, just yeah. get it in and get that placeholder in. Yeah. We, did, we didn't. It was like ninety nine percent figured out. We knew mm -hmm. there were still things to figure out, but if we did not get that yeah. pre certification, it was never mm -hmm. going to happen ever. You know, exactly. Ever. So, it was it was done. So so we just went for it. Next slide. And we got that pre-certification for uh, source zero. So that was that was a good day. A but good we, day. we didn't know it was if you know, we didn't know how it's we did not know what it meant, but it was a very <laughs> yeah. good day. It was like it was a good yeah. news in a, in a sea of particularly confusing news at that time in human history. Yeah. Yeah. So it's back to you, Jeremy. Thanks, Elka. It was really, really fun. And uh, walked down memory lane too. It's been, we've been at this for a while. I mean, that's the thing is we, we designed this project prior to the pandemic uh, and had such a good process with Argo. They feel wonderful to work with and they're so committed to this stuff. They've you know, been working with them for years and they, they came to us, you know, designed some multifamily work uh, and, and weren't familiar with any of this stuff. And we kind of walked them through it and, and, and really, really, uh, very into it, thirsty for it, but kind of moved from just doing like making buildings all electric at first to these like just stepping up to like beefier and beefier assemblies, introducing ARVs. And then when they came across this one, like, well, do you want to go for passive house? And it was kind of like, yeah, we kind of have to. And that's that's been like the everyday is like, should we keep doing this? Yeah, we kind of have to. It's like impossible, but we have to figure it out. Like, so um, it's like this uh, really wonderful and uh, tight relationship and and to the point where sometimes I'm just yelling like no we have to and I'm just going to raise my voice to pretend that's going to make a difference so and I'm going to do all all caps texting and and pretend that makes a difference t9 predictive texting even you know anyway so one of the coolest things about Argo is is that they decided to become post-pandemic after it died it came back months months later they said you know what we're going to self-build this thing and that's the only way in hell it's ever going to happen to have a fighting chance of making this. Um, and they even became certified past house builders in the process. So just big shout out to, to David Ross and Jeremy Turr and Neil Henner and, and all the crew. They just really, they went for it because it's, uh, it's bold and every day continues to be like a real challenge. And that's the new age that like adapting within the adaptation. And we'll get to that. What you're seeing here on the left is some of the assemblies pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, right? after it got a little bit of a booster shot. Um, 
probably too soon for those jokes. We should just cut that from the recording. But um, the one on the left is like, you know, our low in body carbon wall with mostly with our, you know, most of it is our go-to plant and wood-based materials. Like we love, you know, wood fiber exterior insulation. It's like four inches out there. Two by eight, the vertical walls were able to get two by eight. This banked front wall was a little funky to deal with. Nobody knows if it's a roof or a wall to this day. And it, it, we just threw a two by 10 for now. We knew it was too much, but you know, the, there's a lower R value per inch in the wood fiber as much as we love it. And that, that can make it difficult to make these, to pass these condensation uh, sniff tests, you know? So uh, to kind of, and, and it's a little more expensive. So we had to kind of like go a little bit less on the cladding. And it's, so it's composite slate cladding out there over a WRB. And that sadly, the lesson learned after looking at like 20 manufacturers is they all require this like extra layer of plywood outside of the exterior insulation to keep it from cupping once the sun hits it. Like it's really disappointing. Um, so, you know, again, we got it in and said, we're gonna deal with this later. We know we're gonna redesign it. This wall assembly is not making total sense right now. <clears throat> so supply chain shortages and everything everyone else is dealing with has led to a redesign of the wall, which really like all made us look at this again. Like for instance, we finally got wood fiber on a project for like the third time and David went to order it and it was like, oh, it's two years out. I'm like, that's not even a lead time. That's like the time it probably takes to make a new plant, I, I would imagine, and develop a, you know, it's just insane. And mineral wool was out a year. Polyiso was like, okay, great. Let's just get the good foam. Poly Polyiso was out for like six months. You couldn't get it anywhere. EPS, I think David drove down and got it himself. Something like, there's a wild story there, but he got like the last of the EPS in the world and like stuffed it in a way. It was like hoarding insulation. That's what we were up against, right? And I know you were too, it's a tough time. So scheme number two on the right is where we're at now, three inches of EPS exterior insulation, two by eight framing for all of the exterior walls. Uh, this has a higher R value per inch slightly. Ilka can talk about this. We could have made a two by six framing. Two by six worked in the Wolfie model, but Ilka, God bless her said, you've got to have a buffer. Always have a buffer. And I said, no, I live my life fast and loose. I'm from Philly. She said, no, you have a buffer. In Germany, you have that buffer. Thank God, because it saved our asses in the end. And Ilka, Ilka can tell that story. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to uh, the changes through after the, the pandemic, because basically um, it wasn't just the wall with all the challenges that Jeremy just, um, just explained. It was also a huge switch in our window spec. Oh yeah, drove, thank you. drove a lot of this. Because um, again, as I mentioned before, like the, the building that we had pre-certified, um, we realized that we could have slimmed that down already, but we still you know, pre-certified it. We used all the best of the best uh, materials and or what, what we felt like, you know, sure. low embodied and really high performing windows and everything. And then um, we basically entered this the second round and really evaluated, okay, is what we pre-certified really what needs to be built, which we knew it's a no. So what, what can we do here? So besides the um, switch to different materials, there was also a switch to, um, to a window that was uh, slightly lower in performance. And that uh, we all know how much impact windows have in a Wolfie model. So that changed quite a bit. So um, we basically went you know, for the wall assemblies kind of went back up to two by eight um, wall, but also realized that there is, you know, the solar heat gain coefficient in windows have a pretty big impact too. So if we went with a slightly higher solar heat, heat gain coefficient, again, we would have made it uh, to, the, to, to the two by six wall. But we also were aware, and there was quite a bit of talk at that time about uh, sp specifically in multifamily homes, um, passive houses, uh, that there is a danger of overheating. So uh, we were very concerned about that because we did not want to, uh, or, you know, Jeremy and, and David did not want to build a house that is great in performance, but uncomfortable for the occupants. So we actually picked a window um, that had a lower solar heat coefficient to avoid overheating, but that meant that we actually had to go back to two by eight wall instead of yeah. two by six. So, and I'm, I'm very proud of that decision <laughs> because okay. it's, it's just yeah. going to get hotter, right? So totally. we don't want to, to just blast air conditioning um, into, into this, this home. 
Um, and the developer builder was very amenable to that. Like, you know, they, they weren't, even though the framing costs were going up and they were just, they're like, they understood the idea of a contingency, even if it was a thermal contingency, you know, it made yeah. a lot of sense to them. Yeah. So uh, then what happened is because there are so many changes, we actually had to resubmit for pre-certification. Typically, if there are smaller uh, changes, um, you know, you can basically just log it during certification, but changes like this, which is basically almost all of the specifications <laughs> for the envelope, uh, required a resubmittal. So we basically kind of started not from zero, but pretty, you know, um, you know, from the beginning. And we did not have to change any of the geometry of the building. So that was good from a Wolfie perspective because- And a zoning to, perspective, no yeah, re, yeah. no re-amendments to the for building permits or anything. Yeah. So that's, that's really good. Yeah. So it's basically figuring out doing, you know, playing the whole kind of game again with um, where, how do we get to, um, to meet certification here? And uh, what happened is that because we, so formally we had these robust um, assemblies and we were easily able to cover the solar to meet source zero that, you know, by, by switching to less robust assemblies that actually had an impact on the, on the solar canopy. So, and we weren't really sure if we can still meet the source zero. So the next round of certification, um, next slide, was actually then certified uh, as a uh, FIUS Plus project. But we knew if we are able to meet the, the requirement for the, for the PVs, that we could switch that to source zero once we get there. So, but that this was our second certification for this project. And then uh, it changed again. Changed the know. third time, third time's <laughs> a charm, friend, third time's a charm. Yeah, so because we got the news that, um, you know, things, everything got so expensive. Solar panels got COVID, they're out. You know, yeah. it turns yeah. out solar it turns out, you know, massive steel canopies, the hold of solar panels. Uh, yeah, you know, that, that came in far more expensive, you know, price of steel went up, price of labor, went, price of everything went up, everything's crazy. And it just, they came in higher than anticipated. Let's put it that way. And we needed, it's not, it wasn't just the steel, it's just everything. And we're just looking for ways to value engineer it. And I really thought again, the project was, the past cost was done. And but we were gonna save a couple hundred thousand dollars just getting rid of the solar panels and the canopies. And as much as that stinks, you know, I said, okay, well, I guess Passive House is out too, but Ilka and I talked and, and we thought about it. And, you know, there's this whole myth about like green power purchase agreements with, with Fias, where you like, if you can't put solar on, you just like purchase green power. I've never been able to figure out, nor do I know anyone who has been able to figure out how you work that out when you're selling individual market rate homes to people on spec and you're supposed to include that into a mortgage clause or something like that. It's, just, it's a myth. And so I know that it's a great idea, but that's why I think FIAS 2021 core was developed to say, just give so much more leeway. And, and like Ilka worked with FIAS, they were extremely helpful and said, do we have a green building rating system for you? We know how hard your life is. And they worked it out and it was like music to our ears. As sad as it is to lose these things, it allows us to keep certification and offer solar panels and even the canopies as a buyer option because we had already had the the substructure installed for the canopy to attach to the like extra engineered lumber so we're like solar canopy ready as crazy as that sounds we can we can that could be a buyer option if there's pre-sales um, and i'll link those pre-sales in the chat in case you're looking to move to philly these are a deal i'm telling you these are a steal there's nothing like this in philly come and buy one i'll be your friend so uh, yeah, basically we had to do another switch to then the, the 2021 FIAS core certification, which allows us to, um, yeah, not need um, PVs or uh, yeah, solar, but only, and that's, that's what Jeremy um, kind of said before. So the, if you do the, and I didn't want to bore you with more Wolfie pictures, but basically what happens- I love those Wolfie pictures. <laughs> they're, so, they're like um, renderings made in a GeoCities <laughs> website. They're just amazing. Or like Microsoft Draw from 1993. I love them. They're great. 
Yeah, maybe I should have put them in. But anyway, so what happened once I switched over to the 2021, uh, because uh, so the, the there's another calculator, which um, calculates your targets slightly different. And I don't want to get into all the differences, nor I, I, I don't know if I could actually explain all of this. But basically, our targets uh, changed a little bit. And because we had a buffer, from the beginning, um, we were still able to meet all the heating and cooling targets and uh, basically have to, in order to not need PV to, um, you know, to, to hit that target force for source energy, um, we have to make a little change to basically be a little bit more airtight or pick appliances that are slightly more energy efficient. But under end, we have to um, provide parking spaces for um, electric. Oh, you vehicle. have to provide one EV yeah. ready parking space per yeah. unit. So if these yeah. didn't, it's so funny how this locked in. Mm -hmm. If they didn't have garages, mm -hmm. you're out, right? And so it, it is just a, which is sort of weird because I think Fias is still, and this this is just a bit of a critique on the whole thing is. The whole system, including the building code, nothing is set up for urban infill work. You know, that's just this is my big violin right now. I sort of 10, 10 more seconds, but like nobody's thinking about urban infill work and the retrofit work. You can't set up a system for that. They can. It's it's it, you know, the whole thing is so we gotta stop thinking about single family homes as these places where you can just toss a car in the driveway. We don't have any room for that stuff in the city. And cities are dense and, and sustainable and all the infrastructure is there, but you know, so even to, to, to have the EV ready space, we're, we just got lucky because we happen to have our non urbanist garage in these things, right? But if we didn't, certification was out. So it's worth noting that. I think that should be optional, frankly. Yeah, so, well, for us, it worked out. It certainly did. <laughs> so we went from 15 to 18 to 21, and uh, here we are. And who knows, 23. Hey, let's keep going. Let's just uh, keep. Who knows? We'll Hopefully, get it done. How about we'll, that? Yeah, let's get it done. Um, thank you, Milka. Um, here's a picture of it under construction. I might toss up a, a Instagram page here in a second too, but uh, completion date, 2022. Uh, supply chain shortages uh, and, and uh, unfavorable, some unfavorable subcontractor pricing has kept us, uh, all of us on our toes. Uh, triggering ongoing design and detailing revisions to the installation, window install, cladding. By the way, with that EPS foam, we don't need, we need far less layers. So with EPS, we're looking at natural slate cladding now, which is like favorable in pricing to the plastic stuff. That was radical. We're looking at some folks in Pennsylvania and Vermont to stay regional. As long as Coupa clad from Spain doesn't just buy them all up tomorrow, they're just buying everybody up. All that aside, um, we are adapting um, within this, these forces uh, that it just feels like a meta adaptation, you know, like we're adapting within the forces while adapting to the climate crisis, right? It's been, a, um, I don't know, like a non-binary evolving circus of adaptation, like super fun, just amazing. Um, the solar canopies, uh, they're out, we talked about that. Um, green power purchase agreements, we talked about that. Um, you know, but it's just, it's just been super, super fun. Anyway, uh, let me see if I can actually bring that up because there is a better, look at that. This is more recent. This is uh, Argo's Instagram page. Woot, woot. Isn't that great? Got the, uh, there we go. A little drone, drone footage. Look how small that street is, you know. We wanted to make it a wooner for Living Street, but nobody in Philly knows how to pronounce that. So it just couldn't happen. Um, I think, uh, Oh man, how do I get uh, how do I get out of here? There we go. Figuring life out. Okay, here we are. I think we got some time for Q and A. I, that's all we have, unless Elvi want to jump in there. Um, I wanted to have a little bit of time for chit chat, and th these are project stats, and I'm not going to go over them. You can read them. Feel free to nerd out. You can ask questions about them. Um, but just the stuff at the top there is like. I'm always really proud of this, and it's always so rare when this happens, when you have a concept sketch by the brilliant Amanda Benelli, and then it gets to Ilka Cassidy. Look at that amazing Microsoft draw rendering she did. So beautiful. Uh, Wolfie model, so cool. 
and then the construction document elevation and then framing and then you know beginning to do cladding and, and waterproofing and all that and it just all looks like the same thing and that's always amazing to me when that happens because of all the things that could prevent that from all the way going through so thanks so much for your time it's been a real pleasure